this is it for the announcements. So now uh, let me introduce to you uh, Gabriel Sadowski, uh, which we have the great honor to, uh, to have with us uh, uh, during this ASAT meeting. Um, this is one of the highlights of the conferences. She, she is a senior lecture award um, that was in fact awarded last year, but unfortunately could not deliver, be, be delivered then uh, due to the pandemic. So uh, the 2020 Distinguished Lecture in Thermodynamics and Transport Properties uh, was an award to Professor Gabriel Sadowski uh, from Technical University of Dortmund in Germany for her internationally recognized works related to advances of the statistical associating fluid theory, so SAFT, that you all know. So the perturbed chain SAFT, PC SAFT, approach published in 2001 with Professor Joachim Gross has had a vast impact in the capability to model complex fluids and is widely used now all over the world, uh, even in pharmaceutical industry. So Gabriel Sadowski has received a diploma in chemistry in 1987 and a PhD in physical chemistry in 1991 from the Technical Technische Hochschule Leuna Merzburg in Germany. Uh, and from 1992 to 2000, she was assistant professor the, and group leader for polymer thermodynamics at the Department of Process Engineering at, in Berlin. Since 2001, she's a professor at the TU Dortmund University, teaching fundamentals of thermodynamics, phase equilibrium thermodynamics, polymer thermodynamics, and bio thermodynamics. At the same time, she was appointed director of the laboratory of thermodynamics of its department of chemical and biochemical engineering. In 2017, she was appointed Vice President of Research at TU Dortmund. Uh, her research focuses on thermodynamic modeling, simulation, polymer thermodynamics, thermodynamics of pharmaceutical systems, reaction thermodynamics, and crystallization. Uh, after the development of PC SAFT, she continued extending the application of the very successful approach to very difficult systems, including polymers and electrolytes, and more recently, Professor Sadowski has, has focused her efforts to address challenges in pharmaceutical systems. And that is the topic that uh, uh, she's going to talk to us about today. Gabriel Sadowski has received several awards for her research, including the Arnold Eucken Award from the German Society of Process and Chemical Engineering, the Gottfried Hilm Wilhelm Leibniz Award from the German Science Foundation, and the award committee of the EFCE just stated, in terms of her scientific contribution, she is a class leader in our field. And more importantly, she is a great supporter of our community, a great teacher and a mentor to many young scientists. So with that, Gabrielle, I will give you the floor. John Charles, thank you very much for this very kind and very, very nice words. I, I indeed feel very, very honored and excited to receive to receive this award. So this is really a great honor to me and also to my to my group and to all our friends and collaborators. So and I'm also very excited to see you here in front of in front of me and to stay here with with friends. This is really really great after this long time we had to stay more or less on our own in our university. So I'm very happy to see you here, even though it's it's virtual. And I very much hope that we will see each other very soon also in person. So thank you, Jean-Charles and the whole French team that they organized this very, uh, very exciting event here and that they make it possible that we meet here and also uh, that I'm now able to take you with me on a journey about what we what we did more or less over the last 10 years. So I now try to share my screen. And yeah, I will have to. Okay. So this is, sorry, I have to a little bit to the back to see what yeah. so this is what I what I want to, uh, to talk about and to share with with you uh, thermodynamics and pharmaceutical development so what 
what what what did we do so sorry i have to go a bit forward again sorry for this uh, managed to uh, move forward or backward yeah i have the problem yeah that's the problem i have to move forward again uh, let's see if i can help uh, so here you are Okay. Yeah, moment. I have to go to the. You, the, the on the bottom right of your of, of the. Of oh the, yeah, no, I, I got it. I think I got it. Okay. Oh, it's the laser that you look for, look for. Okay. No. Move forward. I can click on the on the on the slide if you like. No, please, I don't do this. <laughs> So I, I I will do this on my own. But the, the thing is, I uh, I cannot see my I cannot see the whole presentation. So that's that's actually the problem. Ah. Um, okay, now I, I got it. So if if we are talk about uh, pharmaceuticals, it's 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 actually a medicine we are talking about. So this is what we take as a patient. The molecule that does the job is what we call an active pharmaceutical ingredient. So this is the API as such. It is all, usually only a very few milligram part of the medicine. So once we want to have a medicine at the end, that means we have uh, to develop uh, to, and to find an API. This is not what we usually do. This is what the people from medicine uh, do. And then we have to produce the API. This is where uh, engineering comes in, so that really makes pure API molecules, usually crystals. This is this is also part of chemical engineering already. But what we take is not the API as such; it's a medicine, so it needs to be formulated. This is how the pharmaceutical how pharmaceutics people call this. So they make mixtures where the API is only part one part of, and there are other excipients other molecules in that formulation that makes really the medicine out of it. And of course, after that, somebody has to take it. So this is where the patient uh, comes in and this is where the patient then has to take the medicine. Uh, and this is as more or less the four steps. And what I want to talk about today is only the formulation part. Uh, so that means really making the mixture containing the API and other molecules, helping the API to do its job. And again, this also contains several steps, so it needs to be developed. So we have to find the right molecules that form the formulation together with the API. Then the formulation has to be produced. It has to be stored for a certain time between production and administration. And then, of course, we have the administration step. Uh, and for, during all these four stages, uh, this is where we have several problems to solve, so to say. For the development is we are looking for excipients that form a homogeneous formulation, which needs to be a homogeneous tab tablet, for example, because sometimes a patient needs to take half of a tablet and then uh, we have to make sure that every of the two halves contains the same amount of API. Of course, production needs to be reproducible. During storage, the formulation needs to be stable. It shouldn't change uh, upon um, storage, and of course, for the administration, it's most important that we have a certain bioavailability. So the API needs to dissolve in the water, needs to dissolve in a body, but it's not just water. And only the mo dissolved molecules at the end do this, uh, their job. Mm -hmm. So that means it's thermodynamics. What is really needed here, and so is, this is how we came in. We met pharmacists asking us whether we could help them in solving these problems. And I will give you in the next uh, half an hour an overview of some examples uh, what we are doing in this area. So it's all about an API, and most of the particularly newly developed API are very, very poorly soluble in water. This is, solubility is as low as solubility of marble. So you can imagine that is really, really a problem. 
And this is all about, so the formulation is to improve this, to find strategies to bring the API molecules into an aqueous solution. There are different strategies shown here, and the ones on the left, they focus on changing the solid state form of the API, forming a salt, forming a different polymorph, or forming cocosless, or even solvates or hydrates. Uh, the ones more on the right, they focus on changing the environment of the API to make it better soluble. Uh, actually, we are working on all of these fields, but of course, in the interest of time, I will focus in my talk on these three uh, examples. So the idea always is to make uh, API, which is not crystalline, which is the thermodynamically most stable and natural form of a pure API, but bring it into an amorphous form. So we would call also say a thermodynamicist to dissolve it in a system where it's then molecularly dispersed and then easily or more easily uh, released into an aqueous system. So I will go uh, for the next half an hour here with you uh, through these three examples. And I will start with the so-called coamorphous systems down here. So what is this? This is a publication of 2016, uh, and a group from Denmark, uh, they are working quite heavily on the so-called coamorphous formulation. So that actually means that you have an API, which is a crystal, and you add another solid component, maybe even another crystal. Uh, and then they find or found that these two crystalline molecules, they form what they call a coamorphous formulation. Uh, and in the abstract, they say, however, there is uh, at the moment no theoretical consensus behind which amino acid, this is the other molecule they have chosen, would be a suitable co-former for a given drug. So what they do is they do a um, trial and error approach and try to find, let's say by chance, other molecules that form such co-amorphous formulations. So looking at this as a cinnamon analysis, uh, we would say this is not a mystery. This is, this is really what we call a eutectic system. So we have an API, which is on the right of the diagram. Uh, and of course, it has a certain melting point. And if you take another solid uh, and mix them, then we, of course, know that they form an eutectic. Uh, and what you have above here, uh, this is what they call a coamorphous formulation. So this is quite well known. And we have, as a thermodynamicist, we have instruments in hand to find those molecules on the left-hand side, so-called helper molecules, so to say, uh, to bring an API into this amorphous state, or we would certainly say liquid state. Uh, and I just want to show you a, an, a, an example uh, where we used UNIFAC in this case, because this is uh, honestly quite easy to use, of course, as you all know, uh, to look for um, suitable excipients for given APIs. This is ibuprofen on the left hand side and lidocaine on the right hand side. So these molecules are here on each on the right hand side of their diagrams. Uh, and then we were looking for other molecules and we could easily screen the activity coefficients in those systems, having just these two components. And then we looked for those uh, who brought us uh, the deepest eutectic point. And this was here, for example, lauric acid for the ibuprofen on the right hand side. Uh, the best molecule turned out to be tumor. And of course, this is very easy to do and very fast. Uh, and what you see is uh, the symbols are data measured by DSC, uh, which afterwards confirmed that UNIFAC is right. So uh, applying thermodynamics could really help or easily to identify uh, what uh, the best excipients would be to have an, a liquid or amorphous even below body temperature. This is, of course, always a benchmark. So we would like to be uh, amorphous or liquid below 35, 37 degrees centigrade. So this works very nicely. And there is a rationale behind this and it can easily be shown that this works for a lot of other systems. Uh, and as you see, we, we 
published our work usually now in pharmaceutical systems because we would like to go to the applicants, to people who could under, understand what, what the basics behind us and maybe make use of it in the future. So this was for the co-amorphous systems. Uh, and of course, instead of having here another solid uh, next to the uh, target API, uh, you could also have here another liquid, for example, a lipid. So there's a whole class of formulations in the pharmaceutical development, which is based on lipids. This makes a lot of sense because it's known that APIs are very hydrophobic. So it's a very natural idea to look for hydrophobic solvents, so to say, if you like. So, of course, the phase diagram is, as we uh, easily understand as thermodynamics, is more or less is the same. Uh, now, the only difference is that the lipids usually have a melting point, which is much lower than that of API crystals. So, just to give you an example, so we started with uh, three glycerides because they are usually used for those purposes. Uh, and this is a C10 glyceride. And zero means that we don't have uh, any double bonds on the molecules. This is just a notation to give you an idea what the molecule looks like. Uh, and this is what you see here. On the right hand side, you see the indometacin uh, in this case uh, up here. And this is phenofibrate and ibuprofen, two other APIs here. And you see that the melting points are quite high. So that means we want to be below 40, we want to actually be, be below 37. So there is a huge way to go in terms of temperatures. Uh, and then what we did is we checked uh, activity coefficients, this time with PCSAFT and for all other uh, calculations I will show you, we also use PCSAFT. And we checked the activity coefficients uh, of these uh, APIs here in these uh, triglyc right. And what you see is uh, that we have very huge um, activity coefficients for endometacin, which is obviously not very um, helpful to dissolve the molecules. So this is the lines we get up here. Uh, and the activity coefficients um, for the other two APIs in the same triglyceride are much smaller. Uh, and this also results in a much better solubility. So that means uh, uh, the idea of endometacin uh, dissolving in tricoplene is not a very good one, but it works quite well for these uh, two molecules down here. Uh, and what you also see that we have different polymorphs very often for the pharmaceutical molecules, which are quite complex molecules. We very often find that there are different polymorphs, not just two, but maybe five or even more, uh, which is not a problem for us because the activity coefficients, this is a liquid property. Of course, they do not depend on the polymorph. So we can use one and the same model and also one in the same parameter set for all endometacin polymorphs. The only difference then comes from the different melting properties. So you see the melting temperatures are different. And this immediately gives us two different curves. And by using one and the same parameter set for endometacin, we get to uh, solubility curves. So this is uh, quite easy to do and very interesting and very uh, let's say very interesting really for the pharmaceutical industry, which really deal and suffer from all these uh, polymorphs. Uh, but we also went a step further because, uh, of course, they like or what, what people like is to use natural oils, uh, which are eatable, because at the end we have to keep in mind whatever we do, every formulation has to be taken by a patient. So we cannot choose just any excipients, but it makes a lot of sense to use natural ingredients, for example, natural oils. So and we found a way to describe, for example, soya bean oil and coconut oil uh, in terms of representative molecules. So this is uh, just an example how we treat this uh, soya bean oil. Uh, and finally, we could even say even it works quite well, even using in this case uh, the main component, which is the C18 um, triglyceride. Uh, and, and then you uh, see that we could even predict uh, the solubility uh, of uh, the ibuprofen, this is the uh, component uh, considered here, in the different oils. And so the coconut oil is the preferred one compared to soya bean oil. And what you also see is the circle down here, this is a eutectic point. 
So the eutectic point for coconut oil is about 25 degrees centigrade, so it's below 37, and the one of soya bean oil is even lower. So both of them uh, are liquid uh, at room temperature, which makes them a very, uh, uh, let's say, favorable. Uh, and, but a little formulation doesn't only, oh, sorry for this, I do not know what happens now. Let me go back. Uh, the lipid formulation is not just the API and the glyceride, it contains a lot of other components or it may contain all the other components. So this is the, an overview by Pouton, uh, the pharmacist who has de defined different types of formulations. Uh, and what we could do is we could by screening a different component, so we have a huge data bank in the meantime, we could find uh, suitable excipient compositions, so mixtures. Uh, this is an example for different APIs you see here. Uh, and we could find excipients uh, that really increase the solubility uh, in the final uh, formulation, which is the green bar, compared to the solubility in the pure glyceride by really a factor of one, about 1,000 or even 13,000 in this case. So what, the, what it says is, it really makes a different what difference what components uh, the formulation is of composed of, and using thermodynamics uh, and PC soft in that case, we were even able to predict uh, what uh, uh, excipient mixture works best for different molecules. And of course, it depends on what the particular molecule is. Finally, you could also say, let's replace the lipid now by a polymer. And actually, this is what most often is done. This then results in what the pharmacists call amorphous solid dispersions. So what, what they mean is uh, that we have now a mixture of, the, of a polymer and, and an API. Uh, and the, the thing is, the polymer doesn't have a melting point anymore, but it has a glass transition. Uh, and this really helps because of course, we want to stay left of the orange line. The orange line is the solubility line of the API. So staying right means that we have to expect API crystals. This is not what we want to have. We want to stay outside here. Uh, but this is restricted to low temperatures because usually you are down here somewhere at between 25 and 37. And then the solubility of the API in a polymer might be very low at that point. So actually all formulations we have found and, and considered that are on the market are uh, here, are right of the solubility line. So this is meter stable. They are super saturated and the API will crystallize at a certain time. And then it's helpful to have the green line, which is the last transition line, because as long as you are below this, uh, this means the API tends to crystallize, but it might take a while. Uh, and usually um, the aim is that it takes longer than two years. Uh, and, and then uh, the pharmacists are happy because they can then make sure that the API is in amorphous form, even for the duration of the medicine, this is usually two years. So to prepare such a polymer API formulation, uh, usually people apply spray drying. So what they do is they dissolve the polymer and the API in a common solvent, and then they spray dry this uh, liquid, uh, and then getting rid of the solvent and ending up hopefully uh, in, a, uh, in a homogeneous polymer API system. Uh, and what was described in literature is that doing this, the solvent has an impact. So this was found in a series of papers that it does matter which solvent was used to dissolve the polymer in the API and to spray dye the system, although the solvent is not present, of course, in the final formulation. Uh, and this is disturbing for, for thermodynamics because we would say uh, if we have at least an equilibrium state of an ASD, this is an amorphous solid dispersion, a mixture of an API and a polymer, uh, and we do not have an other component, so the solvent present anymore, it should not influence the binary system. So this is 
where we ask ourselves, what's happened here? So this is very, this, these are very prominent groups. So we, don't, we do believe that they are right in their observations, but still we don't understand how this could happen. And this is how we started a project to look at it. And uh, the answer is again, thermodynamics. So we have two triangles here, both of them showing uh, on the very bottom, an ASD. So we have a mixture of PVP, which is very often used polymer for pharmaceutical purposes, and naproxene on the right-hand side. And this red dot, this is a target formulation. So we have 20% of naproxene and a final formulation. Uh, and you see here the orange area. The orange area is the area where we do have to expect naproxene crystallization. So this is also verified by experiments as other stars you see here. So this is a PCSAF predicted solubility line. So the, the idea is to stay outside. And fortunately, you see we are outside. So it's possible to dissolve 20% of naproxene and PVP without having any crystal. So this is below a saturation. So we, we would be happy to have this, but still, it makes a difference whether we use ethanol or acetone for the spray drying. And the answer is this phase behavior, because what you see is for ethanol, for if you have a solution of naproxene and PVP in ethanol, we are somewhere here. And then we go to the spray drying, so that means we move along this arrow here, uh, and this brings us very safely to our formulation. But if we look for acetone, and when we see that acetone has a miscibility gap with PVP, uh, and that means that we have a miscibility gap here, and when we start up here by, with our spray drying process, we see that we have to cross during the spray drying uh, a two-phase region, and then we have uh, and then we have two phases evolving and each of them is then dried and one of them will end up here. So that means we will get crystals uh, during spray drying. And of course, at the very end, if we don't have acetone in the system anymore, uh, we are then back here. So the system will mix, but this might take years, particularly as we are below glass transition. This is a green area. This is where everything takes very long, and this is where we are at the end of the spray drying. So it makes a difference what solvent we use as long as we are not in equilibrium. And being in equilibrium may take four months or even years in those formulations. Uh, and if you would like to know more about this and what we really did uh, to find the right solvent and how also we are now able to describe the drying process as such and how we can find or let's say propose uh, suitable solvents, this is what uh, Stephanie Dorn uh, did during her PhD and she uh, if you like, uh, she gives a talk uh, tomorrow, and if you like, she will then uh, talk more about the details of her work. So we are now have, happy, we have our formulation, but for, for example, via spray drying, and now we are at the storage. Uh, the thing is, we have storage conditions. We have certain temperatures. You see here we are at 25 degrees centigrade. Uh, and we have certain relative humidities. Uh, this is what we calculate what would happen if we have a very dry system, so no relative humidity, no air uh, containing water vapor. And this is what we say what the solubility line is for the system, ibuprofen in PVP. Uh, and then uh, we wanted to prove this, and we formulated different formulations having different ibuprofen contents, and then we stored them. Uh, at the moment, we are storing more than 1,000 samples, actually, in our lab to see whether we are right or wrong with our predictions. Uh, and what you see is the numbers. This tells you after which days we found crystallization. So we predicted that these three samples right off the solubility line would crystallize. And what you see is two of them already did. Uh, and this one is still not crystallized, so far at least, but we are very sure it will because it's right off our line. Uh, the ones left to the line, they are uh, below solubility, so we expect them never to crystallize. So this is really what the pharmacists are happy about. They would like to have really amorphous uh, ASDs, no crystals. So this is quite fine as long as we are at 
dry conditions, no relative humidity. And then he made a prediction for the system, what would happen if we now go to 75% relative humidity. You also go to 40 degree because the pharmacists, they have different predefined conditions where they do make uh, their tests, their storage, they call it long-term storage test. And one is at 25, uh, 0% relative humidity, and another is at 40 degrees centigrade, 75% relative humidity. They call it so-called accelerated conditions. So this is what we did is, and this is our prediction. So we do have still the solubility line, but then we have on the left-hand side a mixing gap coming up. And it comes, so that means we, this is a three also, all you see a binary diagram, but it's, actually a diagram of a ternary system because we have in a vapor phase 75% relative humidity and then we calculate how what is the amount of water absorbed at that, that conditions in the formulation. And of course, as for the different formulations, we have a different ratio of the very hydrophilic polymer on the left and the very hydrophobic API on the right. These formulations do absorb different amount of waters. And the most amount of water is absorbed on the left hand side where we have a low amount of the hydrophobic API and a lot of hydrophilic polymer. And this is where we now see uh, the miscibility gap coming up because the API doesn't want to be dissolved in a mixture of polymer and water. This is, it try, tries to avoid the water. And so we do get here a huge miscibility gap. And this is what our prediction said. And then we wanted, of course, to prove whether this is right or wrong. So we made all these formulations. Every circle is a formulation and we stored them. And we expect that the ones on the left hand side not to crystallize, but to demix. The ones on the right hand side not to demix, but to crystallize. And interestingly, the one in the middle, this is where the ones where we expected them to be stable. Um, and this is what our experiment says. So we very fast saw the mixing. We also saw for all of the right, right, three samples on the right that they crystallize one after the other, starting with the one with the highest super saturation. And these two in the middle, they are still amorphous. This was also new for the pharmacists because of course they know the higher the drug load, uh, the higher the danger of crystallization. So they always try to be as much to the left as they can. But of course, as we can see here, this is also not very helpful because here you might have the mixing. So this one's the ones in the middle, this were, were the ones which really was, were the most stable ones. Uh, and then Christian Lübert, actually this is his work I'm talking about, uh, he did confocal Raman spectroscopy. So he really made a scan, XY scan of a sample containing ibuprofen and PVP at that particular conditions. Uh, and what you see here, the concentration of ibuprofen is color coded. So red means very high ibuprofen concentration and uh, blue means very low. Uh, and the target uh, was 20% of drug loading. Uh, and this was this, this point we are looking at at the moment. And actually what you see is nowhere in this formulation uh, we have this 20%, but instead we have, uh, let's say, uh, regions where we have a high amount of API and a low amount of API. And the concentrations very nicely uh, fit uh, to our prediction. So we have one phase containing about 40% of the ibuprofen and another one containing about 5%. So, of course, this is also a very nice proof that the uh, calculation or prediction of the ternary system is not just qualitative, but it's even uh, quantitative in, in most cases. So, and we did this for a lot of other systems, just to show you another example. So, this is philodipine, this time the API. Uh, you see that we have different polymers here. We have PVP, we have polyvinyl acetate, and this is a copolymer out of the two. Uh, and we stored this, or we did the predictions at 0% relative humidity and 75. Um, and this, the, you see the symbols are our experimental data. Uh, and what you see is it looks quite different. So it doesn't matter, it does matter what the polymer is, but it also does matter what the relative humidity is. 
And of course, having a thermodynamic model in hand, you can do the predictions for either different components and of course also for different relative humidities. And sometimes we get an a used humidity gap, this is what you do see here, and other cases uh, we don't. Uh, and so far, um, our predictions uh, agreed with what we have found experimentally. And of course, it's very, very worthwhile to have uh, those predictions before starting an experiment, which runs for months or even years. So you see the huge numbers here, and you have seen the 1000 on the previous slide. So uh, in a pharmacy, they really do the same storage experiments we do, but they wait for one year or even longer to find out what the result is. Uh, and having a tool in hand that gives you beforehand an idea which of the polymer might be more suitable than another is of course very worthwhile to have. Uh, and then we measured uh, the water sorption. So this is a water sorption experiment. And what you see is uh, you have a, we, we had a certain ASD and at the, at the point zero, we started to enter or to have a certain relative humidity in the system. And what you see is we had a very fast uh, mass increase. So what the ASD does, it absorbs water, obviously. Then it stays for a while at this high level and then it's decreasing again. And this is uh, strange. So why is this? why is water released again from a system wh while keeping the overall relative humidity constant? Uh, and this is what we proved by PXLD. And what we really see is this decrease is related to a crystallization of the API in the ASD. So this is an amorphous uh, PXLD pattern at the beginning and a very, let's say, crystalline PXLD pattern at the end. So that means uh, this is really something that goes hand in hand. So you have water absorption and during water absorption or after that, uh, you have crystallization. And this is, of course, what needs to be avoided. So that's why we now focus on this step here on water sorption and also on the combined water sorption and crystallization. And this also as function of time, because as I told you, uh, the formulations that are on the market, they are meta-stable. So the, the pharmacists now know, from us at least, uh, that the, their formulations will crystallize, but, and then of course it makes a difference when this will happen. So time really matters. Um, and this is why we are now focusing also on kinetics. Uh, and this is an example of, for water absorption kinetics. Uh, so, uh, Dominic Bormann from our group, he looked at a water absorption kinetics in uh, the API and also in the pure PVP. Uh, and this is his measurements. And what you can see maybe behind, this is his modeling uh, of this absorption curves. And what he then did, he combined these two diffusion coefficients that, he, where, that were determined from the absorption curves, curves, and then he predicted what would be uh, the water sorption in the ASD. This is shown here for 28% of the inhibitor seen in PVP, but of course he can do this uh, for any other drug load. Uh, and this is a pure prediction on the right hand side. You see again the lines, this is what he predicted in the experiments. Uh, this is the symbols and it gives a very nice fit. Uh, so he is now able to describe the water sorption kinetics even below and above the glass transition, which I, which I do not show here. Uh, and if you like to know more about this, uh, he has a poster uh, tomorrow and he will be happy uh, to explain he, you uh, how and uh, what he did. And of course, now the next step is also to combine this with the crystallization uh, happens in happening in the ASD upon this uh, water sorption. And now that I'm here uh, at administration, because it's not only that uh, API crystallization might happen during storage uh, of an ASD, maybe at hum humid conditions, but of course it will certainly even more pronounced happen upon dissolution. So what happens is if you dissolve uh, the final medicine in the body, then it is released 
And then it depends on a supersaturation, not, not anymore in the ASD, but in the aqueous environment, whether this API will then recrystallize in the body, which is of course very bad because we would like to have this into our, why are the membranes uh, crossing, passing into our bloodstream and then do its, doing its job. So that's why we also now um, focus on the dissolution behavior. This is an example in water, but of course, body fluid is not just water, but this is the starting point, what I'm showing here. This is indometacine in water. So what we have here is we have three types of experiments. Uh, we said we will have dissolution of the API. This is a blue experiment here. Uh, and what you see is we have, we have two points here on the right. This is the crystalline, this is the solubility of the crystalline in the metacine and water, and this is the solubility of the amorphous in the metacine and water. They are different, and usually the one of the amorphous uh, component is higher than the one of the crystalline one. So that's why people would like to have the amorphous form. Uh, and we have both of these lines, so we are able to predict what the solubility of the amorphous compound is from the one of the crystalline compound. Um, and of course, if we then have the amorphous in the metacine and we dissolve this into water, it will then release it in the water until reaching its solubility. So this is the green points are the uh, experiments and the green line, this is our modeling. But we know that we will also have crystallization because of course, with respect to the crystalline solubility, the API is supersaturated at that point, obviously it is. So we did separate recrystallization experiments. This is the orange symbols here and the orange modeling. And this will finally end up and stop, of course, at the solubility line. So once we have uh, in a body a dissolution, we have both. We have dissolu dissolution and then after a while, of course, from the dissolved molecules, we will have recrystallization. So we combine the orange and the green line to predict uh, the overall behavior, and this is a black line. So this is our prediction of the dissolution recrystallization behavior as function of time. Uh, the black symbols, this is the experiment. What you see is that we do a good job at the beginning, but then uh, the prediction overestimates the concentration of the API uh, compared to the experiments. So there must be something else going on, which we do not have in the green and in the orange curve so far. So this is when we not consider what we now know we should have considered because we have found in literature that there is a solid state transformation or at the surface of the API happening during being in contact with water, that, that means during the solution. <coughs> and this was observed and also investigated by other people. So this, they call it an amorphization or a <coughs> crystallization of the initially amorphous uh, form. And we took their uh, data into account. So there was no fitting here, but we took their data. What is uh, the kinetics of this recrystallization at the surface of the API? Uh, and this is what we then got. So this is a combination of our green curve, of our orange curve, and of the recrystallization at the surface behavior was in a different medium uh, from literature. And then our prediction very nicely fits what really happens in a system. Uh, and of course, this is in water. We are now on the way doing this uh, more and more moving towards real body fluids. So taking also account other molecules that are in the aqueous system in the body, but this is really what you see, um, what it does. Uh, and how this uh, fits. Uh, and we could also, uh, if we go to an ASD, then we not just have the pure API, but we have a polymer, of course, which together is released with the API. And it's, that's why the first step to investigate what this component does to the dissolution behavior. Uh, and what we did is here, of course, it changes, PEG changes the solubility of indimetacine in the water. Uh, and just by taking this into account, so you see the endpoints are different. We have the solubility without having the PEG, and this uh, orange line is solubility of endometacine in the presence of PEG. 
uh, and just taking this into account and keeping all other kinetic parameters as they were at the beginning, uh, we see that we are also able to predict the influence uh, of the polymer on the distribution behavior of the API. And this is, by the way, what the pharmacists call the parachute effect. So that means they want to uh, have, as long as they can, a high concentration uh, of the API before, at the very end, it will finally crystallize. And uh, this is now my last example, and I would like to summarize some take-home messages. Uh, take-home message is that uh, using thermodynamics, we can say which of the formulations is thermodynamically stable. That means does not change, and also API does not crystallize. But most of them, if not to say all of we have considered at least, they will change this, this time because they are not thermodynamically stable. Uh, and that means it's very worthwhile to search for excipients that increase the stability to keep them longer stable or more stable to decrease the super saturation. Uh, and it's also uh, useful uh, to control uh, the conditions of API uh, formulation during production of the formulation, but also particularly during storage, because water is uh, the most, uh, let's say, dangerous uh, component for the uh, for the API during storage. Uh, and it's not enough that we look at thermodynamics, because as this is a metastable uh, state, we are looking at kinetics becomes very very much important. Uh, for the long-term stability and also for the dissolution. But of course, also kinetics is at least half thermodynamics, and so we are still in. Uh, so I very much like uh, to thank our sponsors, uh, which really make possible that we can do those projects. And of course, most of all, I like to thank my group. Uh, this is a group photo uh, from last year. So as you can easily see, is a pandemic group photo, but still it's a group photo. So I'm very happy to have these people with me. And of course, they are the ones who are really doing the job. And my job today only is uh, say nice words and explaining uh, to you what, what they actually did. Uh, and I also, of course, like to thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much.